dear students, dear guests, it is now my honor and privilege to introduce today's keynote speaker, Professor Jose Antonio Campo. He is certainly an example of such a distinguished person who has gotten really far in fulfilling all these wishes that I just spelled out to the students. Professor Ocampo is a renowned economist. He studied at the University of Notre Dame and received his PhD at Yale University. He has taught economics at several prestigious universities around the world, and he is the author of numerous books tackling problems of economic development. Yet Professor Ocampo did not confine his activities to academia. He decided to use his skills for the common good as a public servant in his home country and in international institutions. So he served uh, in several positions in institutions in Colombia, his home country. Among others, as chairman of the Central Bank of Colombia, director of the National Planning uh, Department, and as a minister of agriculture and rural development, and as finance minister as well as either. You can see already quite an impressive national career. Being six years minister in a country like Colombia is quite an achievement. Uh, he then became an international public servant at the United Nations, first as executive secretary of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, and later as undersecretary for economic and social affairs from 2003 to 2007. His services as undersecretary general was crucial for devising new development policies. Above all, he is one of the most prominent figures pursuing the Millennium Development Goals. After leaving the United Nations last May, Professor Campo now serves as the Professor for Professional Practice in International and Public Affairs at Columbia University, our, one of our partners, and he is also an active member of Columbia's Committee on Global Thought. Jose Antonio Campo brings the knowledge and insight of a first-rate policy economist and economic historian together with broad experience as a leading international public servant and former cabinet minister. It is truly an honor to have you here today, Professor Campo. You, you have the floor. Thank you very much for coming. Dean Professor Cern, uh, first of all, thank you for your very uh, kind introduction. Uh, Professor Bindencroft, Chairman of the Board and other members of the Board of Trustees, uh, the professors uh, of the Hertie School of Governance, uh, dear graduates of the class of 2008, ladies and gentlemen. It is a, a great honor and a great pleasure uh, to be with you today at this graduation ceremony of the Master of Public Policy at the Hertie School of Governance, which has rapidly earned a place among the most reputable world institutions in the field of governance and public studies. It is also a pleasure to be back in Berlin, which incarnates a troubled history but also the reconciliation of Germany with herself and with its rich contributions to the world in culture, philosophical and social thinking, the creation of institutions of social protection, and science and engineering, to just mention a few areas. But of course, and most importantly, it is great to be here on the occasion of the 2008 graduation of 40 students from all over the world. I just thank Dean Cern for the invitation to be with you today to present on this propitious occasion some reflections on global governance and particularly on global economic and social governance. There is probably no other subject that should concern you all as much as this one. Be it because you will work with international organizations 
or in national institutions and civil society organizations, or in the private sector, the governance of the global order should be at the center of your concerns. Indeed, no national institution and no private enterprise can be thought of today without taking into account its links with the global processes. Global civil society has itself become a rare democratic ingredient in a system that continues to be characterized not only by a strong deficit of global governance, but also in particularly by a strong deficit of global democratic governance. All of you, dear graduates, should therefore make a major commitment to making the global order better, to express it in the words of the United Nations Millennium Declaration, you will be actors in facing the central challenge of our times, which is no other, according to the Declaration, than ensuring that the globalization becomes a positive force for all the world's people. Even if we leave the political issues aside, global processes hit us daily in the news. If we just go back to those issues that have been at the center of concerns of global debates over the past 12 months, we can start with the U.S. financial crisis that erupted during the summer of 2007 and which continues to have significant effects on the global economy. We can continue with the debates leading to and following the meetings of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in Bali late last year. The dramatic rise of oil prices is part of both processes, whereas the recent recognition that the polar bear is an endangered species reflects not only the effects of climate change, but also the fact that we are in the midst of one of the greatest catastrophes of biodiversity. The food crisis has figured out in the center of the news, with the threat of more than 100 million people joining the ranks of the extremely poor in the world. And the almost daily reference to the issues of international migration is a manifestation of a broader problem on which I will focus a large part of my attention today, that of global inequalities. We see this phenomenon first in growing international inequalities. Although the rapid growth of most developing countries in recent years is a welcome development, it takes place within the context of a significantly widening gap between industrial and developing countries over the past two centuries, and most recently during the last two decades of the 20th century. A second dimension is widening inequality within countries. According to research undertaken a few years ago by the United Nations University, approximately nine out of 10 citizens in the world live in countries where income distribution has deteriorated. We could therefore talk of rising inequality as a true global pandemic. On top of it, we face the growing sense of economic insecurity faced by workers in industrial and developing countries alike. The combination of the distributive effects of market reforms and the simultaneously weakening of the institutes of, institutions of social protection or the lack of them in several developing countries offer the best explanation of the joint phenomena of inequality and insecurity. These trends imply that there has been a major redistribution of world, wing, of world income over the last decades of the 20th century. The winners include parts of the population of China and India and the relatively rich households of industrial countries, while the losers have been Sub-Saharan Africa and most poor and middle-income recipients from the less successful middle-income and transition economies. The frequency of winners and losers is, is set in a world economy in which the only redistributive mechanism at the global level is official development assistance, which makes up only a meager proportion of global income. Let me perhaps emphasize, however, that despite these distributive tensions, the current globalization process has also included the gradual spread 
of common principles and international social objectives, a trend that I have called the globalization of values. These principles have been sanctioned in international declarations and agreements on human rights and in the declarations and plans of action of the United Nations conferences and summits, including in particular the Millennium Declaration. These principles and international goals represent in a, in a deep sense the social dimensions of globalization and are deeply rooted in the long history of a struggle by international civil society for human rights, social equity, gender equality, protection of the environment, and more recently globalization of solidarity and the right to be different, that is cultural diversity. These trends are of course no immutable realities. Although forceful technological and economic processes underlying globalization can be shaped, and indeed the form that it has been assuming has largely been shaped by explicit policy decisions or by their absence. In this sense, one of the most disturbing aspects is the uneven and unbalanced character of the policy agenda that accompanies globalization. Some issues dominate the agenda free trade, intellectual property rights, investment protection, and financial liberalization. But others have been left out altogether. The mobility of labor, particularly unskilled labor, taxation, especially on capital, the formulation of competition rules for multinational corporations, the design of effective instruments to ensure an adequate technological transfer to developing countries, and compensatory mechanisms to assure that inclusion of those countries and social groups that tend to fall behind in the globalization process. But the most important imbalance is undoubtedly that which exists between the rapid globalization of markets and the, relative, and the relative weakness of the international social agenda. Herein lays the rationale behind the call to recognize that global interdependence must be matched by the broader provision of global public goods. This call could be seen as a demand to face three major deficits of global governance. The gap between global interdependence and rulemaking, the uneven economic and we can add political playing field for developing countries, and the insufficient attention to the social dimensions of globalization. As a result, global public goods should, be, should aim at meeting three basic objectives of international cooperation. Managing inter interdependence, gradually overcoming the asymmetries that characterize the global economic system, and building a social agenda for globalization based on human rights-based approach, or in other words, building global citizenship. While the first of these objectives emphasizes interdependence among nations, the other two focus on equity in its two dimensions, among nations and among citizens. Let us examine more closely each of these deficits and the nature of the global public goods that should be provided in each case. First, managing global interdependence. The first of these objectives is that which better fits the definition of global public goods in welfare economics. These goods include a vast array of economic, social, and environmental issues. Knowledge, cultural diversity, the fight against international pandemics, environmental sustainability, the regulation of the use of global commons, rules that regulate international economic transactions, and world macroeconomic and financial stability. There is, of course, a huge gap between the recognition of global interdependence and the weakness of the existing international structures, that is rulemaking, provision, and financing, that generates, that, excuse me, that guarantees that these global public goods are adequately supplied. Climate change and world financial stability are two cases in point, and there are even more important concerns in the two remaining areas. Second, facing the uneven playing field for developing countries. Some of the asymmetries that characterize the global economic system are macroeconomic and financial in character. 
and reflect the fact that the international currencies are the currencies of industrial countries, that capital flows in a very unstable way to, develop, to the developing world, and as a result of both factors, that these countries face greater economic vulnerability and a more limited policy space to manage global business cycles. Others are associated with the high concentration of technology generation in industrial countries, which is the major basis for the power of multinational corporations, and the uneven and increasingly costly ways in which technology flows to the developing world, including the barriers that trade protection continues to build against the transfer of productive activities to the developing world. And the third set of asymmetries is associated with the contrast between the high degree of capital mobility and the limited international mobility of labor, especially of low-skilled workers. This asymmetry derives its importance from its regressive impact, since it can be posited that the benefits from globalization will flow disproportionately to the more mobile factors of production and to the detriment of the less mobile factors. Because of the strong trend towards inequality generated by these asymmetries, leveling the, the playing field by regulatory means, which has guided efforts to revamp the international economic order in recent years, is an inappropriate guide to international reform. Attempts to apply the same measures to different conditions may only serve to heighten existing inequalities. Thus, the principle of a special and differential treatment incorporated in the trade agenda and of common but differentiated responsibilities enshrined in the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development are more appropriate guidelines for building a more equitable global order. These principles should be applied to the areas of finance, technology, and trade. This has been done, but only in a piecemeal fashion and in the area of finance subject to intrusive conditionalities. It also requires keeping adequate policy space for countries to undertake active development strategies. And of course, overcoming the third asymmetry means that the international migration should be gradually incorporated into, into the global agenda. Third, placing the social dimensions at the center of the global agenda. Building global citizenship in a heterogeneous international community implies both the respect for basic economic and social rights, as well as for cultural diversity. Thus, recognizing the principle of, reconciling the principle of equality with the right to be different. This means that the social dimensions of globalization should not be approached as an afternoon to an economic agenda. And this means, in turn, approaching the social dimensions in an integrated way, through policies to make economic growth inclusive, including through skill development and employment generation, through the development of universal social protection systems to address the growing risk faced by workers in more competitive environments, and through the allocation of adequate fiscal resources to guarantee these objectives. However, social policy and upholding economic and social rights continues to be an essentially national responsibility. So adequate policy space for active social policies is a fundamental element both in industrial and developing countries. And such space requires guaranteeing a strong tax base, which implies that limits should, be, should have to be found on tax competition and evasion, which benefit capital income. To the extent that at the global level, the major development in this field are the declarations and plans of action of the United Nations conferences and summits, it is essential to move to a stronger political accountability for commitments made at these conferences, obviously in a way that is commensurate with each country's develop, uh, level of development. The political visibility and the mechanisms designed to evaluate progress toward the Millennium Development Goals represent major progress in this regard. It will be important to build on this experience and create new and broader mechanisms of accountability for all commitments made at these conferences. And such accountability should be gradually made, make room for the possibility of citizens being able to judicially demand 
the fulfillment of their economic, social, and cultural rights, and of other international social commitments in competent national and international courts, a step that only members of the Council of Europe have taken so far. On the other hand, the existence of significant global inequalities and asymmetries means that economic globalization will succeed in achieving convergence in the levels of development between countries only if it is accompanied by resource flows explicitly aimed at that objective. The official development assistance target of 0.7% of GDP should be seen as a first step in this regard. The European Union, through the policy of social cohesion, has created a more ambitious mechanism for the international community to eventually follow through the design of a global social cohesion fund that facilitates the fulfillment of economic and social rights of the poorest members of the international community. Dear graduates, in the absence of an adequate provision of global public goods, globalization is proven to be a highly disintegrative force. Furthermore, the lack of appropriate global structures has increased the influence of the more powerful states and the large multinational firms. This situation has also been affected by the resistance of the majority of countries to give up their economic sovereignty to international organizations, even in the most highly advanced regional process, the European Union. And globalization has created in turn a policy competition among countries willing to show its attractiveness to investors in an era of capital mobility and greater susceptibility to the location of, produ of production. Under the strong market forces that characterize globalization, the deficits of global governance have implied that market regulations have weakened worldwide. The countervailing force generated by the spread of democracy and the establishment of international social objectives has been, has turned it been const has been constrained by the erosion of the room of maneuver, the policy space of nation states. Moreover, the necessary space required by democracy to engender diversity has been reduced as a result of the homogeneity of norms and the strong weight of conditionality that continues to characterize international financial assistance. The absence of a true internationalization of politics is, in this regard, the major paradox of the, global, of the current globalization process. In, in other words, the simultaneously strengthening of democratic forces and the distributed tensions that characterize globalization has not been accompanied by the strengthening of the political institutions that would reduce the tension between these two processes. These trends have deep implications for the international order. In the first place, they imply that the central chance of globalization is the creation of democratic spaces of a global character. However, the process of building a modern or more democratic global order will be necessarily slow and incomplete. Therefore, as long as the nation state remains the main space for the expression of political citizenship, the promotion of democracy as a universal value will only make sense if national processes of representation and participation are allowed to determine economic and social development strategies and to mediate the tensions created by globalization. This means, therefore, that the international order should be strongly respectful of national diversity, obviously within the limits of interdependence. This implies that an essential function of international organization is to support national strategies that contribute to reducing through political citizenship the strong tensions that exist today between the principles of equality and the functioning of globalized markets. It is convenient in, to recall in this regard that successful multilateralism under the original Bretton Woods arrangement was precisely based on a judicious mix of international rules and cooperation which provided sufficient degrees of freedom for national authorities to pursue their growth and development goals. In this light, the current mix of weak and incomplete international arrangements and weakened national policy effectiveness must be seen as the most inappropriate of all possible 
mixes. Another implication of my analysis is that the efforts toward building a strong institutions for a better global order should be based on a network of world, regional, and national institutions. Rather than being limited to one or few international institutions over which one or a few member states exercise a monopoly or oligopoly of power, regional institutions have in particular an essential role because they complement global institutions in a heterogeneous international community and give, up, and give an adequate voice to smaller nations. And national institutions have a central role because, as already emphasized, they are the space for democratic politics. Thus, a system that relies on networks and on a strong global, regional, and national institutions is more efficient, more balanced in terms of power relations, and more democratic. Lastly, steps taken to restructure the international order should ensure the, particip the, the participation of developing countries on an equitable basis in global decision making, and that the global agenda be expanded to include the interests of all countries and all actors. Ad hoc mechanisms of coordination, the Gs, starting with the G8, should be seen as no substitute for international schemes having the largest possible number of active participants and which derive the legitimacy from broad representation and the adoption of appropriate rules of governance for all institutions is essential in ensuring the basic rights of developing countries, especially the smaller ones in an international order. Dear graduates, this is the challenging agenda before you. As you move into your new responsibilities, you should never lose sight of the fact that the world before us is a world where interdependence has reached levels never seen before in history, and where our only desirable future is a future of global citizenship. A global citizenship that is active in the task of overcoming the basic deficits of global governance and actively supported for the provision of global public goods to manage our interdependence, the gradual correction of asymmetries that characterize the global economic order and a strong social agenda a citizenship that is respectful of diversity and therefore of the major cultural manifestations that humanity has produced and the many new ones that we are yet to see. I thank the Herty School again for the kind invitation and all of you for your attention. I wish you the best of your success in your professional life. Thank you.